APCO Basic Science Topic Multiple Gestations According to the CDC, in 2015, the twin birth rate was 335 per 100,000 births, and the rate of triplets was 103.6 per 100,000. The incidence of multifetal gestations has increased over the last several decades because of both the shift toward older maternal age as well as increased use of assisted reproductive technology. Multiple gestations arise from the deviation in the process of fertilization and early fetal development. They carry unique obstetric concerns compared to singleton gestations. The objectives of this video are Describe early fetal development from fertilization to implantation Understand the physiology of twinning and understand the pathophysiology of placental abnormalities in monochorionic twin pregnancies. To review the clinical management of multiple gestation pregnancies, please view the APCO clinical education video, Topic 20. Let's meet our patient, Molly Tipple Gestation. Molly is a 28-year-old Gravda 1 who presents to your clinic for her initial obstetric intake visit at 10 weeks gestation. When you perform her ultrasound, you see two different heartbeats. Molly is pregnant with twins. In order to best understand the physiology of twinning, it's important to recall the process of early fetal development. The ovulated oocyte is surrounded by the zona pellucidum and usually is fertilized in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Fertilization of the oocyte by a sperm creates a zygote, a diploid cell with 46 chromosomes. Cleavage of the zygote creates two diploid cells, or the two-cell stage, with each cell referred to as a blastomere. From day 0 to 3, further division of the blastomeres form a solid ball of 16 cells called the morula. Next, on day 4 or 5, differentiation begins and fluid accumulates between morula cells in addition to further cell division to form the 58-cell stage, or the blastocyst. Five inner cells differentiate to form the inner cell mass, which will give rise to the embryo and the amnion. The inner cell mass is surrounded by 53 outer cells, which are trophoblasts. These will give rise to part of the chorion. The trophoblast cavitates to form the blastocele, and this entire structure of the inner cell mass, trophoblast, and blastocele is the blastocyst. And surrounding the entire blastocyst is the zona pellucidum. As the blastocyst nears the endometrial cavity, the blastocyst is released, or hatched, from the surrounding zona pellucidum in response to proteases that are secreted by the endometrium. The hatched blastocyst and its trophoblasts are then able to associate with the endometrium and the blastocyst implants at days 6 to 7. As mentioned previously, the trophoblasts differentiate to form the chorion, while the inner cell mass differentiates to form the amnion and embryonic disc. The blastocyst with surrounding trophoblasts grows and expands even before implantation, the trophoblasts differentiate and form the chorion, which gives rise to the placenta. Following implantation, the amnion is developed, which gives rise to the amniotic sac. Last to differentiate is the embryonic disc, which gives rise to the embryo. Now, with the process and terminology fresh in mind, we can dive into when and how the process of early development can lead to twins. There are both dizygotic and monozygotic twins. Dizygotic twins, which represent about 80% of twins, develop from a doubling of the entire process right from the start. Two different oocytes are fertilized by two different sperm, resulting in two different zygotes, hence the term dizygotic. The two zygotes then proceed through subsequent development. Monozygotic twins, representing about 20% of twins, arise from a single fertilization of one egg by one sperm, followed by a split of the one zygote initially formed, into two zygotes. Note that all dizygotic twins are dichorionic, diamniotic, as there are two zygotes from the start, with fertilization instead of a split during development. The timing of the split in monozygotic twinning determines the chorionicity and amnionicity, or the number of chorion and amnion, of the resulting monozygotic twins. In monozygotic twins, depending on the timing of the split, there can be dichorionic, diamniotic twins, monochorionic, diamniotic twins, and monochorionic monoamniotic twins. In general, the earlier the split, the less structures are shared, as cells early in fertilization have not yet differentiated. Meanwhile, the later the split occurs in development, the more structures are differentiated already and will be shared or mono by the monozygotic twins. A split that occurs on day 13 or later, after the embryonic disc has formed, results in monochorionic monoamniotic twins that are conjoined or share body parts. 
craniopagus twins in which skulls are fused is shown. Conjoined twins are more commonly conjoined at the thorax. Let's pause, read, and apply. Do dichorionic monoamniotic twins exist? No, because the chorion differentiates before the amnion, there cannot be dichorionic monoamniotic twins. So, with the general principle that structures that have differentiated by the time of the split are shared, and structures that have not yet differentiated are separate, let's see how each of the monozygotic twin combinations that do exist arise. Dichorionic diamniotic twinning occurs when the split happens within the first three days after fertilization, before the morula stage. At this point, there has been no differentiation of the cells, so all structures that develop thereafter are doubled. Didi twins represent about 33% of monozygotic twin gestations. Monochorionic diamniotic twinning results when the split occurs between days 4 to 8, after the trophoblasts have differentiated but before the amnion has formed, so there is one shared chorion for the two embryos that develop from the split, each with their own amnions that will form around them. Monochorionic diamniotic twins are the most common of monozygotic twins, representing 67% of them. Monochorionic monoamniotic twinning occurs when the split occurs between days 8 and 12, after the differentiation of the chorion and amnion, though before the formation of the embryonic disc, and thus results in one shared chorion and one shared amnion around two separate monozygotic twins. Momo twins represent about 1% of monozygotic twins. A split that occurs on day 13 or later, as previously mentioned, results in conjoined twins. The extent to which they are conjoined depends on how late the split occurs. Now that we know how twins can develop, let's revisit your examination with Molly and her twins. You maneuver the ultrasound probe to get a view with both twins in sight. Let's pause, read, and apply. How do we differentiate between dichorionic and monochorionic twin pregnancies on ultrasound? On ultrasound, dichorionic pregnancies are diagnosed with a lambda sign. Let's note the differences. In this dichorionic diamniotic pregnancy, there is a dividing membrane. Visualized here is the lambda sign, also known as a twin peak. This is most predictive from 10 to 14 weeks, which means that early ultrasound is critical in twin pregnancies. In this monochorionic diamniotic pregnancy, there is only a thin dividing membrane with an absence of the lambda sign. In monochorionic monoamniotic pregnancies, there is no dividing membrane. On the ultrasound with Molly, you see a thin dividing membrane representing the amniotic membrane. Molly has monochorionic diamniotic twins. You counsel Molly on complications that can occur with multiple gestation pregnancies, which can be reviewed on the APCO clinical educational video topic number 20. You review with her some complications that can affect monochorionic pregnancies. Growth restriction results from unequal distribution of nutrients either from unequal placentation in the case of dichorionic twins or vascular anastomoses of shared placental vessels in monochorionic twins. There may also be unequal distribution of blastomeres in monochorionic twins. The vascular anastomoses in the placenta also give rise to a complication unique to monochorionic twins. They facilitate twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. So how does twin-to-twin -twin transfusion occur? With monochorionic twins, there can be deep arterial venous anastomoses in the placenta. In this cross-section, you can see the artery is surrounded by muscle, which allows it to maintain blood pressure and blood flow, while veins have no muscular layer and are a low-pressure system. In an AV anastomosis, an artery is connected to a vein. The blood will move from a high-pressure artery to a low-pressure vein in a unidirectional manner, creating a unidirectional shunt. As a result, blood is pumped from the donor to the recipient. This leads to an imbalance of blood volumes. The donor becomes anemic, growth-restricted, oliguric with oligohydramnios from decreased renal perfusion. The recipient becomes polycythemic with circulatory overload, also known as hydrops. Treatment for twin-to-twin -twin transfusion includes laser ablation of fetal anastomotic vessels, amnial reduction, septostomy, or selected reduction. For a further review of twin-to-twin -twin transfusion and other complications in multifetal gestations, please watch the APCO educational topic number 20. This concludes the APCO basic science video on multiple gestation pregnancies. We have discussed early fetal development from fertilization to implantation, the physiology of twinning, and complications of monochorionic pregnancies.